Sorry, that's the only one. Welcome to the Congregational Church of Algonquin, the United Church of Christ. Join us as we come before the Lord with gratitude and praise, offering God the worship of our hearts and our lives. May our worship open our eyes to see the divine presence among us, and may our music open our ears to recognize the voice in the Holy Spirit. Good morning. We have several announcements this morning. Uh, the very first one is, yes, it's true. Starting tomorrow, the governor has issued an indoor mask order. And so we want everyone to stay safe and healthy here and at home. So please wear your mask when indoors or grab one at the door when you get in. And we thank you for staying safe. Today, right after worship service, the church council will meet in the conference room area. So grab a cup of coffee. Council meetings are open to everyone who wants to attend. And then today is a fifth Sunday, and we're receiving the offering today in honor of Turning Point, which is a home, a domestic violent group that is in, located in Crystal Lake. And we know how much they appreciate your gifts. Good news that on September 12th, we start our fall programming. Um, that's when the Christian Ed starts for the kids. And uh, immediately after service, there will be a potluck. We ask that you sign up in Fellowship Hall or right outside the narthex there or call the church office. You can even register online uh, just to let us know what you bring and if you're coming. And then, la and not last at all, but first I want to tell you guys, the choir is getting ready to rehearse this Wednesday for the first time. I just wanted to point out, Brian and I saw the Aretha Franklin movie this weekend, and if it was good enough for the Queen of Soul, it's good enough for us too. So join the choir and become wonderful. All right, we have one other last minute news, and this is good news to share. 
the heavenly attic is about to reopen again. And we're very excited to see that. Um, now, they are asking that we don't bring any new things in until after September the 11th because they're getting all set up and ready to go and cleaned up. And they're going to observe COVID rules, and they will be open only on Fridays and Saturdays from 10 a.m. till 4. And uh, all safety precautions will be taken to keep our, our workers safe and to keep our customers safe. And finally, last but not least, we're so happy that you're with us this morning. And just remember never to put a period where God has placed a comma. God is still speaking. Lord, the source of all good things, we pause now in your presence and we hold our day before you. Still us, calm us, Guide us as we enter this day and this worship. Would you please rise? Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we gather this morning in this house of worship with thanks to your love in our home away from home. O oh, Lord, we come to add our human voices to the chorus of praise raised by your creation. We come as we are, distracted and weary, hopeful and open, and to know that you accept us and are ever mindful of our cares and joys. Still in us now the many voices that clamor for attention, that we might center ourselves upon you. Speak to us in word and melody and quiet, that we may be renewed in our faith and strengthened for your service. Amen. Please be seated. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of the disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do you disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesies rightly about you hypocrites as it is written, this people honored me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called to the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All of these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This summer I've been doing pastoral readings from books uh, and uh, usually I, d I do our meditation and then go into the reading. Today I want to do uh, the reading first. Uh, this is a little bit of a complicated uh, subject so um, and bear with me because there's some Hebrew words in there and I am not a Hebrew scholar, okay? Although you probably won't know whether I make a mistake or not, 
So. Both traditional religious and secular scholars agree that ritual washing in Judaism was derived by the rabbis of the Talmud from a more extensive set of ritual washing and purity practices in the use in the days of the temple in Jerusalem, based on various verses in the Hebrew scriptures and of the received traditions. There is disagreement, however, about the origins and meanings of these practices. Philo of Alexandria refers to ritual washing in the context of the temple and Leviticus, but also speaks of spiritual washing. At Qumran, basins which served as baths have been identified, and among the Dead Sea Scrolls, texts on maintaining ritual purity reflect the requirement of Leviticus. According to the editors of the 1906 Jewish Encyclopedia, the phrase netilat yadaim, referring to washing of the hands, literally lifting of the hands, is derived either from Psalm 134, verse 2, or from the Greek word natla, uh, in reference to the jar of water used. The Jewish Encyclopedia states that many historic Jewish writers, and particularly the Pharisees, took it to mean that water had to be poured out onto uplifted hands and that they could not be considered clean until water had reached the wrists. The Christian New Testament states that in Jesus' time, Pharisees and all the Jews would not eat until they had washed their hands to the wrist, and it was noteworthy that Jesus and his followers did not wash. According to the Jewish Encyclopedia, the historic requirement for priests to first wash their hands together with the classical rabbinical belief that non-priests were also required to wash their hands before taking part in a holy act, such as prayer, was adhered to very strongly, to the extent that Christianity adopted the practice and provided worshipers with fountains and basins of water in churches, in a similar manner to the molten sea in the Jerusalem temple, functioning as a lava. Although Christianity did not adopt the requirement for priests to wash feet before worship, in Islam the practice was extended to the congregation and expanded into wudu. According to Peake's commentary on the Bible, biblical scholars regard the requirement of kohanim, washing their hands before the priestly blessing, as an example of the taboo against the profane making contact with the sacred. And similar practices are present in other religions of the period and region. The Jewish Encyclopedia relates that according to Herodotus, the Egyptian priests were required to wash themselves twice a day and twice a night in cold water. And according to Hesiod, the Greeks were forbidden from pouring out the black wine to any deity in the morning unless they had first washed their hands. According, again, to the 1906 Jewish Encyclopedia, the letter of Aristia states that creators of the Septuagint to wash their hands in the sea each morning before prayer. Josephus states that this custom was a reason for the traditional location of synagogues near water. Biblical scholars regard this custom as an imitation by the laity of the behavior of the priests. A bar Bereta offers as justification for the ritual of hand washing after waking the belief that a spirit of impurity rests upon each person during the night and will not leave until the person's hands are washed. And the Zohar argues that body is open to demonic possession during sleep because the soul temporarily leaves the body during it. The Kabbalah argues that death awaits anyone who walks more than four yards from their bed without ablution, meaning washing your hands. The cup containing the water has to be able to carry a certain amount of water, and it should have two handles. According to Peake's commentary on the Bible, the priestly code specifies that individuals were washed before they beca could become members of the Jewish priesthood, and similarly requires Levites to be cleansed uh, before they resume, assume their work. Peake's commentary states that although biblical rules regarding ritual purification following bodily discharges clearly have sanitary uses. They ultimately originated from the taboos against these bodily discharge due to the belief that these contain life more than any other bodily fluid or any other aspect of the body. According to Genesis, Adam and Eve had brought death into the world by eating from the tree of knowledge. 
Rabbi Arya Kaplan points out that the most of the laws of impurity relate to some form of death. One who comes into contact with one of the forms of death must then immerse in water, which is described in Genesis as flowing out of the Garden of Eden, in order to cleanse oneself of this contact with death and by extension of sin. Now, why did I go through all this trouble? I don't know if you got anything from this. If I find this kind of history exciting myself, but then I'm probably a little weird about this. But um, this whole idea always strikes me when I read this passage. What are we talking about when we talk about defilement? We live in a time when this word isn't used really anymore religiously. It used to be that, as I read, you, if you were going to come to the synagogue, you had to wash yourself. You at least had to wash your hands up to your wrists. And you had to do it in a very specific ritualistic way. One of the things that we have in the world today, in the world of the church particularly, is that we are pushing away the rites. For example, rites that we have left in the church, in our church, in the mainline church, are few. There's communion, there is um, baptism, what we call our sacraments. We have the rite of weddings, we have the rite of funerals, and, we, and of course the rite of baptism. But I can tell you the world is changing to the point that the rites of weddings and funerals are being taken away from the church. Families are doing them themselves, there, uh, because now the rite of ordination now has been watered down to the point that anybody can be ordained anytime they want to by going on the internet. All of you can be ordained ministers this afternoon. And you can perform weddings. There have been people in our church that have been asked to perform weddings. There have been people in our church that have taken, uh, their families have taken on themselves for them or somebody else in their family to do their funerals. It's no longer considered to be a right. Uh, to, and when I say right, I'm not talking R-I-G-H-T. I'm talking R-I-T-E, to have a funeral. Even in the Catholic Church, COVID has changed the way, and probably will for a long time, the way the Catholics think about the rights that they hold, the right of um, receiving communion from the, the priest. They had during quarantine, the, the Pope granted dispensation for all the Catholics to take communion in their homes. Now that's a big change in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church holds on to more rights than the Protestants do. But the right that we're talking about in Scripture, that Jeff read for us in Scripture, is a right that many Jewish people, not only Jewish people, but Greek, Romans, uh, Muslims, held very strongly this right of defilement and cleansing and purity. We don't have it in that way, but we have it in another way in our society, and I want you to think about this for just a minute. What animal or insect would you like to see wiped off the face of this earth? I know you have your own favorites. There are some of you that would be very happy if no one on this earth ever saw a snake again. There'd be other people that'd be very happy for spiders to disappear. I, for one, think possums are a completely useless waste of <laughs> oxygen. There's a very fascinating book, uh, and it's called Beast with, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Battles with the Beast. And it goes on the history of human relationships with animals. And the, the author is a scientist, and, uh, by, and, she, and she's been working all over the world all of her life. And she starts the, the story by talking about how she was in Kenya after a time that she had been spent, she spent in, uh, with the people of India. And so while she was in Kenya, she was showing the people of Kenya her pictures that she had got of the people in India. And one of the pictures, that she, or a group of pictures that she took caused the Kenyans to become extremely angry with her. And in fact, they said, 
you are tricking us. There is no way that you could have taken these pictures. And what the pictures were is the Indians and water buffaloes. Now, why that caused such a strong reaction to the Kenyans is the Kenyans believe that water buffaloes are among the dang most dangerous creatures in Africa. You don't want to come near a water buffalo. You don't want to be on the same road with a water buffalo. When you're driving down a road in Kenya and there's a water buffalo, they tell you to speed because that water buffalo will just crash into your car. They're nothing good for water buffaloes. They do not try to tame or use water buffaloes for anything. They just keep their distance. They hate water buffaloes and would like to see water buffaloes eliminated from the earth. In India, on the other hand, water buffaloes are tame. Water buffaloes are work with the people, the people live with them, the children ride on their backs, and they actually milk and drink the milk of water buffaloes. But in India, they tell people, you can't even take a small one and train it to be tame. It'll grow up and it'll kill you. Now that's water buffaloes. Think about that. Two different places, India and Kenya, two completely different ways of looking at a relationship with an animal. The thing about defilement is that we try, it, it's, it's, I, I don't want you to think of it as dirty as much as I want you to think of it as a boundary. Defilements are set up for boundaries. Now, you can read the Old Testament and probably tell yourself you have all of these purity issues, all of these things that defile, all of these things uh, that defile one human being that keeps another human being from being in um, company with another human being. And there are rules, very intricate rules that they had to follow. And, as most scholars will probably tell you, it has to do a lot with hygiene. Why don't Jews, uh, Jewish people, uh, uh, why is there laws against eating shellfish or pork? It could very well be because there was no refrigeration. That may not be, but it could be. It could be a hygiene issue. Back then, when they didn't have hygiene, I can tell you now that I've talked to a lot of Jewish people, I've read from a lot of Jewish people, who make it clear that while they consider themselves to be faithful Jews, they do love bacon. You know, it's, it's just different. You know, ours is the same way. There are rules in, um, of the Puritans that we would never think about following when we came into church. But yet we are descendants of the Puritans. And so we, uh, our ancestors would be shocked and amazed at what happens in our churches because of a lack of what they see of uh, attention to purity. Jesus was saying something very profound. Jesus, by the way, followed the purity laws. He, uh, there's several times in the Old, New Testament that they talk about the fact they don't say that he was washing himself before he went to the temple, but they say where he was, which was at the entrance of a bath. They, they have found now in Israel over 800 baths. Uh, archaeological digs that were next to religious places uh, so that people could take baths before they walked in. Jesus followed those purity symbols. He didn't try to push them out, but what he was saying is that there comes a point that you've got to realize where the impurities actually exist. It's not the impurities on your hand that determines your relationship with God. It's the impurities in your heart. We now are in a world now where we have to start thinking about uh, banners. We, uh, I mean, about boundaries. Boundaries of masks, boundaries of germs. I mean, I have seen people around the world wearing masks before COVID, but I never realized how important they are until now. Um, they're not rights. You don't get up and pray and then put on your mask. Maybe you do, but you, you're not required by the church to put on your mask. You're not required to uh, say prayers over him, put holy water on him, and then put them on your face. It's not a religious boundary. 
It's a social boundary. And that's what Jesus was trying to say to people, is that these boundaries that are established in the church were established as social boundaries. We respect them because we respect each other. If Jesus thought that him and his disciples were going to be doing harm to other people by eating from the grain that they were plucking from the earth at that day, Jesus wouldn't have allowed it. But what Jesus was saying is that the defilement that comes from the Pharisees and the Sadducees in his day was so much worse than picking grain and eating it before you washed your hands. There is defilement. There are boundaries. There are times that we cross boundaries. And maybe there are times that the church should reconsider the rights that we have given up. But most importantly, we've got to understand that all of this is only good when it enhances our relationship with God and his creation. Rules of purity are never good if they take away from our relationship with God. Let us pray. Every moment we have the chance to breathe in your goodness and your grace. And every hour we have opportunity to share your love and your hope. Every day we have occasions to rest in the comfort of your heart. In you, Lord, we discover the fullness of time. O oh God, in every challenge that we face, we can find the strength to persevere. In every person we meet, we can find the blessing you have sent. In every need we encounter, we can find the help you would have us offer. In you, Lord, we discover the fullness of life. In every conflict of our lives, there is your healing that we can offer. In every brokenness we experience, there is that reconciliation we can receive. In every difficulty which makes us stumble, there is that dance of hope that you would teach us. In you, we discover the fullness of faith. O oh God in community, holy in one, in you we discover the fullness we long for. Fill us with your compassion and love so that we would willingly share some of our abundance with those who have need. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ who came so that all of humanity might come to know the abundant life that comes from you. Amen. Please rise and join me in the last hymn. join me in prayer as Jesus has taught us and joins with us in saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
are sent by God to be God's people in the world. We will go to sing of God's joy and hope to all. We are called by Christ, adopted into God's gracious family. We will go to share the good news of Christ's grace for everyone. We are chosen by the Spirit to care for and serve creation, and so we will go to join hands with our sisters and brothers. 